Good morning, good afternoon, and or good evening. You are watching Nubs Collection, a YouTube series dedicated to the cataloging and review of every game in my physical media collection. As always, I am your host, Victor Nub, and today we are looking at Street Fighter II Turbo Hyper Fighting. Developed and published by Capcom and released in the United States on home consoles in August of 1993. Now, technically the arcade version of the game came out a little bit earlier than that, but we're obviously playing the home release version of the game, specifically the Super Nintendo version of it. Now, obviously, this is an updated version of the original game, Street Fighter 2, which uh, would not be an exaggeration for me to describe it as a global phenomenon, originally released in arcades on February 6th of 1991. That's the original version, obviously. Uh, across all versions of Street Fighter 2, both home release and arcade, the game has grossed an estimated $10.61 billion in total revenue, making at one of the highest grossing games of all time. Now, that stat may actually be a little bit off because I have no idea what time that amount was pulled. And video games as a medium and also just from rising costs of development for other games uh, tend to just displace each other as highest grossing of all time. So it could be that it's no longer anywhere near the top of the list. But at one time, this game was just a juggernaut. And of course, that's considering all the various re-releases of the game, ports to different consoles, arcade cabinets, all of that's taken into consideration when you figure the $10.61 billion figure uh, is, is how much money it's made. Uh, I'm going to be reading from notes today just to introduce the, the game because there is quite a bit to talk about when it comes to Street Fighter 2. This is the only one that I ever actually owned when I was younger. We may or may not look at another Street Fighter 2 game as part of my Super Nintendo collection. I haven't decided yet. It would likely be Super Street Fighter 2, but we'll, we'll see what happens in the future. Um, anyway, let me go ahead and continue with my notes here. Street Fighter 2 was a dramatic evolution of the original release. Street Fighter, duh, in which players took control of a single character, Ryu, in a tournament featuring eight opponents that would only sporadically reappear in later releases in the franchise. The lone exception to this was the final boss of the game, the quotes, Emperor of Muay Thai, Sagat. Street Fighter did feature a two-player mode in which the second player took control of Ken, who of course plays very similarly to Ryu, a tradition that basically carried forward for many years of the franchise, only in later releases of uh, Street Fighter, not necessarily Street Fighter 2, but 3, 4, the various offshoots, did they actually differentiate the abilities and uh, special moves that the two of them would use. But for the longest time, it was basically you were just using the same character, but with a palette swap essentially. Uh, Ryu has, uh, uh, he's brunette and Ken is uh, uh, blonde, but essentially they were the same character. Street Fighter 2 would expand upon the roster of available characters, featuring eight mostly unique characters, excluding Ken, with their own attacks, combos, and special moves. Those characters include Ryu from Japan, the returning lead character of the original Street Fighter, and an expert in Ansatsuken or Shotokan style karate. He was canonically the winner of the tournament in the very first Street Fighter. I don't know if anyone ever officially defined the canonical winner of Street Fighter 2. Uh, I've heard reports that it was in fact the character Akuma, who doesn't even appear in Street Fighter 2 or Street Fighter 2 Turbo, which we're playing today, or most versions of the game until you get into the later re-releases or updates to the game. So I don't know how accurate that would be. Ken from the United States, Ryu's, Ryu's best friend. I'm not sure how you say that, Ryu or Ryu. I've always said it as Ryu, but we'll we'll try to get it right. It's Ryu, I believe. Uh, Ryu's best friend and former training partner, also an expert in Shotokan karate. E. Honda from Japan, a sumo wrestler who enters the tournament on a mission to prove that sumo wrestlers are among the greatest fighters in the world. Blanca, birth name Jimmy from B Brazil, an animalistic character that transformed, depending on what source you use, after the plane it, his family was traveling in was struck by lightning and crashed in the Amazon jungle. 
the accident, which has alternatively been attributed to exposure to electric eels, left Blanca with a beastly appearance, the green skin tone, and the ability to conduct electricity through his skin. Chun Li from China, an Interpol officer and expert in Kempo, who enters the tournament after following a lead in the investigation of the murder of her father by the leader of Shadaloo, a crime syndicate. Zangief from the Soviet Union, a professional wrestler and master of Sambo, who enters the tournament to prove the superior might of the Soviet, particularly against American opponents. Other versions of his origin typically assign him a role in the villainous Shadowloo organization, including the rather regrettable live-action Street Fighter movie that came out in the mid-90s starring uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme uh, and uh, Kylie Minogue as Cammy. <laughs> it was... It was bad then, it's bad now, but it's so bad it's good, I, I guess you could say. It's it's very cheesy movie. Uh, Guile, oh, excuse me, I'm jumping ahead. Uh, Dalsim from India, a master of yoga with the unusual ability to elongate his limbs that enters the tournament despite his pacifistic beliefs to earn money to aid those living in poverty. And finally, Guile from the United States, who I used to, for whatever reason, think it was pronounced Gilly, I, I guess because I was thinking of Gilly suits, a major in the United States Air Force and Special Forces operative who enters the tournament to avenge the death of his friend Charlie at the hands of the leader of Shadaloo, M. Bison. Guile's origin includes a mishmash of military associations, at various points in development, being an expert in the Marine Corps Martial Arts Program and also a former Green Beret. If you know anything about what I just said, he was all those things and a major in the Air Force at the same time. Sure. <laughs> the original release of Street Fighter II saw players compete in a circuit of fights against the seven fighters that they did not choose to play as before beginning a boss run against four opponents. Balrog, Vega, Sagat from the original Street Fighter, and M. Bison. Uh, Sagat was defeated in dramatic fashion in the original Street Fighter. He actually was uh, hit by a Shoryuken from Ryu that was so savage, it left a permanent gash in his chest that you can see when you encounter him in this game. Uh, where was I? Players could not choose any of the boss characters in the original release of Street Fighter 2. However, future versions of the game added them to the fighter pool, including the version that we're going to be looking at today. So we will get to see them in action. Maybe not play as them. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that once I get started. Now, a fun little detail about the names of the boss characters in Street Fighter 2. In Japan, the names of the three new characters, the, the boss characters, not counting Sagat, were all swapped. Balrog was M. Bison, Vega was Balrog, and M. Bison was Vega. The reason that it was changed for the U.S. release is that the character M. Bison was an African-American boxer whose name and appearance bore a striking similarity to Mike Tyson. And yes, the M in M. Bison was short for Mike. Fearing legal challenges to the unauthorized use of Tyson's likeness, Capcom elected to swap character names. And frankly, probably the best thing they could do if they didn't want to have to either throw out the character and make a new one, or change what he was dramatically for the video game. So yeah, just call him something else that doesn't make it obvious that it's a Mike Tyson ripoff. Due to feedback from fans, Street Fighter 2 underwent extensive balancing tweaks and upgrades to graphics and play speed through a series of re-releases. I don't have a total for the number of different versions of Street Fighter 2 that exist out there. There were plenty of homebrew or arcade modif uh, modifications that were considered uh, versions of the game. However, I do have a list of versions that represent the most significant changes and updates that were officially released by Capcom. Street Fighter II Championship Edition was released in 1992 and included mirror matches between the same fighter and was the first to make the boss characters available in the player pool. Street Fighter 2 Turbo Hyper Fighting, which we're looking at today, which was originally released in arcades in 92, increased the gameplay speed in arcades and enabled manual control of the game speed in home releases, as well as adding new special moves for several of the characters. Which ones got the new moves? I, I don't know off the top of my head. 
Super Street Fighter 2, which was released in 1993, added four new characters to the fighter pool. Uh, the Mexican uh, Native American character T-Hawk, the Bruce Lee ripoff character Fei Long, the Jamaican uh, kickboxer DJ, and everyone's fan favorite character Cammy from Britain. The arcade version of the game was released on a more powerful system hardware, enabling better graphics and smoother animation. I do believe it was a little bit smoother in the home releases as well. Uh, Super Street Fighter II Turbo, which was released in 1994, introduced super combos to the game and added Akuma to the game via a secret code input. Now, because it was a secret code input that you needed to enter to access the character, he was made dramatically stronger than all the other characters in the roster, and subsequently, tournaments that took place uh, going forward from that release usually ban the character from tournaments simply because it's balanced way better than all the other characters in the game. So uh, if you ever see a tournament involving Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, you probably won't see anyone playing as Akuma. Hyper Street Fighter 2, which was released in 2003, acted as a catch-all version of all previous versions of the game and allowed players to select the version that had the fighters, game speed, special moves, and balance tweaks that they preferred. This game selection function was likely added due to player feedback about tweaks that they either liked or disliked between the many previous versions of the game. And then finally, we have Ultra Street Fighter II The Final Challengers, which was released just a few short years ago in 2017, which featured an HD version of the graphics and an A16-9 aspect ratio, ratio yeah, excuse me, uh, an upgraded soundtrack and some uh, smoothed out sounds. Uh, Akuma was added as a standard character to the player pool. You didn't have to enter a code in order to access him. And two new versions of the characters, Ryu and Ken, or one new version, I should say, uh, Evil Ryu and Violent Ken. Both versions existed in games outside of Street Fighter II prior to their inclusion in this game. I believe Evil Ryu came from the Street Fighter Alpha series, and Violent Ken was one of these uh, match uh, mashup games. I think it was... Street Fighter vs. SNK, if I'm not mistaken, but I might be wrong on that. I could probably spend the rest of this episode literally detailing all of the various tweaks and changes that were made between each released version of Street Fighter 2, but I've already talked enough about the different versions. Let's just go ahead and play the game. So first thing we're going to do, because I am a coward, I'm going to turn the difficulty down a little bit. We want to see as many of the characters as we can. I'll leave the time limit on. One of the things that I always changed when I played this game is I always changed the light punch to L and the light kick to R so that my hard hits were both on Y and B. I tend to just use the heavy handed approach when I was fighting. Doesn't necessarily mean this was the right way to do it. Uh, that should be good. We'll go ahead and start. Uh, we'll do it on turbo. That's fine. I'm probably going to suffer horribly starting out. I'll be very upfront about this. I am not great at this game. <laughs> I'm okay. I know I owned it and I played it a bunch, but that doesn't mean I was ever an expert. We're picking Blanca as the first character because the first time I ever played this game, Blanca was the first character I ever played. Uh, I had a particular affinity for playing as uh, green characters because green was always my favorite color when I was a kid, which if you uh, know anything about me and you're watching this video is probably very perplexing because of course I am red green colorblind, so I can't see all shades of green. I can kind of tell that he's got a, a greenish yellow skin tone <laughs> right now. I think I could actually tell a little bit better when I was younger. Um, the first time I ever saw a Street Fighter game in arcades would have probably been at a Pizza Hut of all places. There was a Pizza Hut near where I lived as a teen that had a small arcade in the back corner of their restaurant that you could, you know, go play on when you were playing uh, or where you're waiting for your food to get ready. And I might have put a couple of quarters in it. Uh, more often than not, what would happen is I would go to the restaurant 
We'd order a pizza, and then I'd just spend 15 minutes watching the intro video, the demo loop for Street Fighter, where you would see two guys on the street, and one of them just throwing a vicious uh, uppercut and knocking the other one down. Camera pans up a building, or maybe that's the beginning, the camera goes down, whatever. I would see that over and over and over, and I would never actually put any money in the machine because I never had any quarters for it. Um, I... I guess the first time I actually played it, if it wasn't an arcade release, probably was when we bought this game. I do remember hearing about the game in an issue of Nintendo Power, which I believe I still have somewhere. Um, I can't remember how you do any of this stuff here. Here. Ah, there we go. All right. So I think. You can, oh, I got beat. I remember reading that particular issue over and over and over because I was so fascinated by the different characters that they introduced in the, the game and just the, the whole idea of, you know, fighting them, you know, hand to hand. And it was just it was a very cool idea. And I don't know how you do the forward cannonball. Is it back for two seconds and then forward? It doesn't matter. I'm kicking this guy's ass. Uh oh, I shouldn't have talked. <laughs> He's getting his revenge. Oh, no. Oh, no, I'm done. He beat me. <laughs> OK, so we are going to swap to a different character. You lose. Again, I never said I was an expert at this game and I turned the difficulty down. <laughs> I would say this is the game that kind of turned me on to uh, fighting games. Again, not an expert. I don't play them very often, so I'm not going to pretend to be uh, an expert in all fighting games or even this one in particular. I just know that this is one of those games that kind of opened my eyes to the genre and then I, I started checking out pretty much all of them. There we go. Yep. Oh. That's how I wanted to finish it. Screw you, dude. I'll say this, I know Ryu really well because that is a character that I used to use a ton when I would play X-Men vs. Street Fighter. There is a little bit of a lag in when you have to hit the attack button when you do an input involving a rotation of the D-pad. Oh no. Him. Nice. I was waiting for him to do that. Yeah, it was always a big mark for Ryu once uh, they started adding super moves and team combos. My team combo when I would play X-Men versus Street Fighter was always Ryu and Cyclops because they both had that really super powerful uh, beam attack where Ryu would just do a Shoryuken and uh, Cyclops would just do a big eye blast, basically. Perfect. Suck it, Guile. <laughs> I believe one of the things that they might have changed in this version of the game or they would have added in the championship version of the game is some of the animations that occur in the background for all of the stages. I'm not going to say that's necessarily true. Oh, come on. It's over. Sit down. I will say they put a lot of detail in the backgrounds in all of these stages to keep them uh, interesting to look at and dynamic. I will not pretend to be an expert at this mode. In fact, I seem to be struggling with just doing <laughs> basic hits. Oh, this is embarrassing. Just hit the stupid thing, dummy. I'll fall. I didn't do it. I think I was short like one or two kicks. I was trying to do special moves and it was like, no, you just hit the stupid thing. USA. That looks like I flew to Canada. <laughs> Round one. 
And where is that? That's not in the middle of the U.S. I was about to say, why am I not getting this? Gotcha. I was trying to do a shoryuken and it just didn't want to happen. Or a hadouken. I do believe with the increase in game speed, the speed of your inputs needs to go up as well. Oh, there's my shoryuken. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, yes, you do. See ya. That was always a big favorite move of mine was to do high, high hit with the jump kick and a low kick so that they would not block it necessarily. Doesn't necessarily mean it worked, because if you play on a higher difficulty, the computer is much more balanced for defending itself, and I turned the difficulty down so we could see all the characters, basically. Now, one of the things that I used to do extensively when I would play as a character with any kind of uh, directional input, and I'm doing it again here today, is I would lick my thumb so that I could roll it over the D-pad more smoothly. <laughs> is that gross? Yes. <laughs> Was it necessary? Absolutely, because the D-pad is not the most forgiving on the Super Nintendo. I think the Sega Genesis actually was a lot more um, designed for that. I'm about to lose. Wow, she rocked me. Uh, I was a little bit more friendly for inputs that involved ro rolling the D-pad because it was a little bit squishier around, whereas the Super Nintendo one, not, not quite so good. Now, you did see one of the unique characteristics of Chun-Li, which is that she can actually kick off of the wall to get out of a corner jam. I believe Vega might also be able to do that, but I, I can't remember. Oh, and I believe the Kikuken, Kiyuken, however you pronounce it, that Chun-Li was doing there is one of the new moves that was added to this game. I believe in previous versions of the game, she only had the two moves, which were the uh, lightning kicks and the spinning bird kick that she does. They wanted to give her a ranged attack to keep up with other characters. I was hoping for sure you can finish. You win. Another weird thing, little detail in the background is you can see a guy back there choking his chicken. That's right. <laughs> right over Ryu's shoulder just a couple seconds ago. USSR. I think it's a nice touch that they include all of the locations for the boss characters on that map because technically you can play as those characters. Oh! Oh! Gotcha. I will not pretend to know what the standard speed of the game was like when it originally came out. I would assume if you play on original versus turbo from the start menu, you would have a, a better idea of how fast or slow it actually played. Uh-oh. And depending on the difficulty you play on, that move can be just devastating when he does a spinning pile driver. Higher difficulty, usually that'll take out most of your health bar. Because they do more damage on higher difficulties in addition to having a little bit more of a, a defensive AI or offensive AI. They're, they're a little bit smarter. All right, let's see if we can do this without botching horribly. I think we got this one. And it's over. Perfect. Oh, look at him. So cool. Posing with his arms crossed over his chest. The wind blowing. Who knows where it's coming from? He's inside a factory. There's no wind coming in at all. <laughs> now, 
one thing I don't have a good answer for is whether or not there was ever intended to be blood, although you do see when you see the Versus screen there that there is a, a decal that looks an awful lot like blood underneath the Versus sign. The Super Nintendo rather famously had a, well, a policy that Nintendo put in place against excessive gore or violence in their video games, so any appearance of blood in fighting games was usually edited out or masked. One of the games that we will look at at some point in the future. See ya. Mortal Kombat was very famous for the fact that it edited all the blood in that game to look like sweat, and all of the fatalities in that game were man made to be far less violent in nature. The one that always sticks out in my mind is that Kano, his mor uh, mortality, his fatality move was to punch his fist into his opponent's chest and rip out their heart. The edited version, he simply punches an enemy in the chest really hard. They shake a little bit and fall over. <laughs> sure, why not? See ya. I'm starting to get the hang of it again. I'm getting confident, probably going to be a little cocky. Now, of course, this is a two-player game, and uh, it probably would have behooved me to actually have someone here to play against, but, you know, things turned out the way they did, and I had to do this one without a second player today. It's all right. We will have some second player input for some of the other varying fighting games that I'll have to look at in the future. This one, I just kind of liked it as, you know, a personal experience. This is one of the games, as I had mentioned in previous episodes of Nub's Collection, that I did get on the Christmas of Too Many Video Games when I got somewhere in the neighborhood of like eight Super Nintendo games because they were on sale at KB Toys and my mom was feeling generous that year. So she just said, tell me which ones you want. And I got this along with a whole bevy of games that were, frankly, just solid all-time games. Oh, he punched me while I kicked him. I guess is a tough character to actually do uh, any kind of jumping attack as he uppercuts. But I just did it, so there we go. He's a very easy character to cheese with ranged attacks because he doesn't have any. He does close distance very well with his running uppercut attacks, but frankly, if you want to just be cheap, you can do that the whole time. Oh, hit me a square shot in the solar plexus, as I used to say all the time on uh, in WWF wrestling. I think I was a big a phrase for Vince McMahon was he would always say, oh, and a square shot to the solar plexus. Oh, my least favorite one, which is you have to do that, 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 and I already botched one. It's over. <laughs> now the game's going to be super negative to me. Well, I got most of them. I think two got away. Never was a big fan of that one. That one's kind of annoying. This character to me, in addition with M. Bison, always felt like the cheapest ones to play because his little leaping claw attack has always felt very poorly balanced in this version of the game. And I suppose there are people who would say, you know, the move, you just got to learn how to block it, but it seems like if you block up, it just never seems to work. And there you go. You can see that Vega, just like Chun-Li, can leap off the back wall because he keeps doing it. Oh, I was hoping to nail him. That was the other thing. He always does those little back handsprings to get out of fight hit uh, hits for uh, your fighting. Gotcha. Cool stage, cool mechanic, the fact that he can leap on the background. Now, of course, if you're fighting in a stage that doesn't have that cage background, he just leaps up in the air and does the claw attack, which we saw earlier. Come on.
Uh oh, got him. Nice throw at the end there. Of course, historically, Vega wears that mask because he feels his face is far too beautiful and doesn't want it to get messed up during fighting. But, you know, who cares? You're fighting in a, a street fighting tournament. So you should be a little more worried about not dying. Oh, it's like that's rocking me. Ouch. Oh, and he does his uppercut move. We're in trouble. I think it's over. I want to throw a tiger uppercut to him. A Shoryuken, if you will. Finish the fight the same way we finished it in the original Street Fighter, where I threw an uppercut and scarred his chest. Of course, it'll require me getting the damn input right, and I'm having trouble with that right now. There we go. That is one of the things that I always disliked about this character is he does tend to do that kind of cheese move where, hey, I did it. Nice. Where he does tend to throw a lot of tiger, whatever they are, tiger balls, fireballs at me. I think the higher the difficulty, the more frequently he does that. He'll just stand on the other side of the stage, throwing them over and over. All right, we're going into the final fight against the boss, M. Bison, who has generated a lot of heat with all the other characters in the game. Killed Chun Li's father, killed Guile's uh, best friend, just the whole gaggle of people who really hate this guy. Not to mention he's a criminal. And it is possible that I lose here. Oh! Or just throw him. <laughs> Boy, the crowd really liked seeing me beat his ass. I will say, if there was one thing that was good about the Street Fighter movie, it's that uh, Raul Julia's character was pretty well played as M. Bison. And that was cheesy. Everything in that movie was cheesy. Am I about to get defeated perfect? I am, aren't I? Nope! All right. Oh, what a kick to the face. He's a tough guy. He is a very, very tough guy to beat. I wouldn't be surprised if I got to redo this a couple times. Oh, what? He dodged. He could see it coming. Oh, I was hoping for a sure you can there. Got him. I got him with a low punch. All right, we did it. Now, you don't get to see any of the special endings for the characters, I believe, unless you do it on a higher difficulty. Yeah, see? So if you do it on a higher difficulty, the way the game usually works is, I think if it's on like three or four stars, you actually get a little clip saying, hey, this character's motivation was this. They did whatever they were hoping to do in the tournament, and they went on and lived you know, their life the way they were supposed to. Uh, Ryu's, uh, Ryu's motivation has always just been, I want to challenge myself and see how tough I am. And then after he wins the tournament, he's like, all right, on to the next one and just scatters into the wind. So his his endings were usually pretty lackluster. Everyone else usually had some different kind of motivation. In the case of Guile, he wanted to basically kill M. Bison for uh, killing his best friend, Charlie. He gets to the end of the uh, tournament, is about to kill him, then his wife and kids show up to stop him, and then they go home together instead of killing M. Bison. Uh, Chun Li, I think, just gets him put in jail, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember. And then there's some other sillier endings for all the other characters, but essentially they're all pretty short vignettes about, you know, what what the final result of the tournament was and how the character lived their life afterwards. Uh, we could go through it a second time, but I think that's probably a good stopping point for this particular episode. Let's go ahead and wrap things up. We're going to do the review phase. Uh, let's go ahead and do a round of the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is the the gameplay is drum tight. I mean, it just it feels really good. 
not only doing attacks, uh, the hit zones for all the moves, uh, their, you know, attack combos, which I was never terribly good at, but I did find a very useful one there, just doing a jump kick to a low sweep and then, you know, getting in close and throwing a little, uh, tight uppercut to, uh, disable the enemy or, or knock them silly so that I could, uh, go in for a Shoryuken. Um, all the characters usually felt very good. Now, of course, I'm sure if you're an expert at the, uh, fighting genre and in particular Street Fighter 2 games, you would probably say, oh no, this game, game was terribly balanced. You know, this character, you know, was way better than all the others because of how much damage they caused or their hitboxes for their moves or anything. I never felt that way about this game. I felt like all the characters had viable move sets to actually succeed with. Now I did terrible with Blanca because I couldn't figure out what the rolling, uh, like the ball attack was for whatever reason. But I know I had beaten the game many times with that character when I was younger. Uh, all the characters have fun move sets. If you play as E Honda, he's got the hundred hand slap where he just whacks the enemy really fast, which is like hand version of Chun Li's lightning kicks. Uh, Guile has a very easy move set to figure out, which is if you hold back uh, for two seconds and then press forward in the punch, he does his sonic boom attack. If you hold down for two seconds and press up, he does his uh, flipping kick, whatever the heck that was called. Um, they're all fun to play, including the boss characters. Now, the boss characters, I think some of them play better than others. Uh, Sagat basically just plays as a lankier version of Ryu and Ken. He doesn't have a spinning kick, the the dragon kick or whatever it's called. Um, he does have, a, you know, the tiger uppercut, which is much like a Shoryuken, as well as fireball attacks. M. Bison, I always felt, was a little bit cheesy because he can do that head stomp and kind of a backflip to hit the enemy. And every time I played either against uh, the, the game or other players, that move, if there were any that felt maybe a little bit unbalanced, it would have been that one. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't stop it. Uh, you can dodge attacks by just performing other attacks that move your character out of the way. Um, I wasn't doing a great job of it, but uh, they're all fun to play. Even the, the less interesting ones, Balrog is probably the least interesting because he doesn't have any special ranged attacks. He doesn't have a really high jump. I mean, it's just kind of like a little hop, but he's, he's still fun to play if you know how to play him correctly. All the characters in this game are, are interesting in their own ways. Uh, the graphics are really good. They look very similar to what the arcade presentation in the original game looked like. And the sound is great. It's fantastic. Some of these stages have songs that I still catch myself humming occasionally as an adult. Just, you know, if I catch a little cue of it, I might be mumbling it while I'm at work. Uh, very memorable music for this particular franchise and the this particular game uh, specifically. As far as the bad... I do think, and this may have just been me, that there was a tiny bit of a lag in performing some of the special moves, and that may have been tied to the increase in the gameplay speed. And I guess the ability to uh, turn up the uh, play speed in this game would have been a big plus, because apparently the original game was just too slow for some people. Uh, I felt like I would have to do the uh, D-pad input wait like a half a tick, then hit the attack button for it to work correctly. If I did it, the D-pad, and then hit the attack button at the same time as the the, the last input of the D-pad, it wouldn't hit. That may have been a, a play speed uh, uh, issue. It may have been me personally, just not re remembering that I had to wait. But it did feel a little jarring because I've been playing... Um, Final Fantasy VI as part of a longer series ongoing on the channel. And when you do the blitz moves, you can hit the attack button at the same time. And I had just wrapped up a play of, a uh, long play of Castlevania Symphony of the Night, where you also have input commands to do uh, special attacks as Alucard. Same thing. You would do the D-pad uh, input and hit the attack button at the very end at the same time as the final input, and then you would do the attack. Here... There's a little hesitation. There's like a little half beat that you had to do in order to make it connect or make all the inputs get read and for the special move to do, happen, which I didn't love. I think they could have just given you that half frame or whatever it is, half second of, of input lag and say, well, he hit all the buttons or all the D-pad uh, input, inputs and the button at the same time. And it worked like it was supposed to. 
Um, it does feel a little bit like if the game wants to keep things interesting, it'll just kind of go into super talented mode, <laughs> for lack of a better term, where it just connects with every attack perfectly and there's absolutely no defending or getting out of, you know, the, the computer's way, which always feels kind of cheap. Like the game is saying, well, you have it lost in two or three fights, so let me go ahead and just go ballistic and be undefeatable for the rest of the fight so that you have to fight a third time. And then you get into the third fight and the computer's like, oh, I don't know which buttons to hit. And I don't know if that was an AI issue or just me getting a little bit sloppy in play, but I feel like that's always been an issue with this game. Sometimes the computer seems like brain dead and other times it feels like it's just doing every input perfectly. The spacing of where they jump or throw out an attack or timing just seems to be perfect to counter you at every step. And that, that just always didn't feel good and made it feel like the, the difficulty setting just didn't matter because if the game decided it's time for you to lose, you would lose no matter what. Uh, as far as the ugly, there's some weird sound effects in this game. The, the elephants at the end of the fight for Dulcim were just very grating when I was a kid. Um, whenever you would win the fight and you hear, row, row, row. I mean, they did sound like elephants, but it just, don't do that. That's really weird. Uh, in addition, like I said before, Balrog just seems like he got shortchanged, uh, in terms of attack moves. Pretty much every character, with some exceptions. Zangief doesn't have any long-range attacks. Uh, neither does Vega. But most characters have a way to uh, throw an attack from a distance to kind of create some space if you need to recover and just, you know, gain footing and, and reposition yourself. His move set is purely just throwing punches in varying ways. An uppercut or, you know, a dash to, to punch the enemy. And it always felt like he was kind of an afterthought in terms of moveset. I mean, they could have done anything. They could have just had him do like a stupid fireball, just like everyone else who needs a ranged attack does. But they didn't give him one. So he always felt like he was the one that, that needed maybe a little bit more time in the kitchen, uh, cooking up the, the moveset for him. And they just kind of pushed it out and said, let's put Mike Tyson in the game. <laughs> and Mike Tyson can't throw fireballs, whatever. Just give him a bunch of uppercuts and dashing punches and whatever. Yeah, that that's the one. If there was one character to complain about in this game as far as moves, he would probably be it. it just not not a great move set and, and doesn't feel balanced like the rest of the game, uh, the, the fighters in the game. Let's go ahead and give the game a score. We do our score in Randars, 1 to 10. I still find this game very enjoyable. I don't think it's as uh, robust in terms of options and move set as more modern games, but I can't hold that against this version of the game because... Compared to the original, it did a couple of things that the original game didn't. It increases the gameplay speed, it added new moves, and it gave you access to the four boss fighters that you could not play in the original Street Fighter. As such, I'm going to give this an 8. It's an incredible fighting game, a still a lot of fun to play today, even considering the fact that the combos are not as easy to figure out, because I don't think they even included those in the instruction manual. It was secret moves or nothing. Um... And the fact that there's at least one character in here who just felt a little bit half-baked in Balrog. That said, it's still a lot of fun today. I probably would have had a ton of fun beating up or getting beaten up by someone else who loves fighting games as well and pro would probably truck me in this one. But uh, just playing it in single-player mode, I had a lot of fun with it today. I think 8 Randars is well-deserved. It's still a good game. Not as good as future versions, obviously. Super Street Fighter 2 introduced four more characters to the pool of ones that you could use in this game, uh, and we didn't get to look at those characters today. We may take another look at this on an episode of Rental Regrets, and I'll see if I can't uh, con one of my friends to coming over so I can beat them up. <laughs> For lack of a better term, I, I guess maybe they would be able to put up a, a challenge if they're just flailing, flailing on the controller because, again, I'm no expert at fighting games and certainly not this one. But yeah, 8 Randars, really good game. That's going to do it for this episode of Nubs Collection. As always, I do appreciate each of you watching, and I will see you next time.